Well, have you seen it in the headlines lately? The news and the truth about aliens. <laughs> now, I have I've given a little peek at the topic today in the last few weeks, and I said we were going to speak about aliens. But it's true. Have you seen it in the news? Now, this has happened for quite some time, but it seems to be ramping up. There's headlines of alien signals being captured. You know, these signals that are picking up in these satellite dishes. Down in, I think, in a Mexican parliament of some sort of meeting, a quote-unquote expert showed two small alien mummified beings dead in their coffins. There's whistleblowers that are talking about the USA is indeed hiding the secrets about aliens, and they are true, and they are out there. I will say, yeah, I think I know the truth about aliens. Aliens indeed are true. They are. But not really like how everybody thinks of the topic. In fact, you probably know, maybe you've even suspected there are aliens among you every day. I know we've probably all bumped into some of those individuals that just seem out of this world. But indeed, there are aliens all around you. Now, not in the extraterrestrial type of way, but actually God has a lot to say about aliens, but more in a spiritual sense. Turn with me, if you would, over to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to turn to one of the first mentions, or at least right after, one of the first mentionings of God's plan that he has for man. Genesis 1 and verse 26 shows that first verse, but we're going to be reading verse 27. Right after God says, let us make man in our image, that is indeed their plan, making God, man in their image. Verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God created humans. We know this is the case. This happened thousands of years ago. Now let's go to verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God finishes the work that he has done. On the sixth day, he makes man. And then, as we know, on the seventh day, God takes a Sabbath rest. Much like what we're doing today on an annual Sabbath, he takes a rest. And if we could speculate a little bit, perhaps he had the first Sabbath service. We do know indeed that God taught Adam, and he spoke with him, and he walked with him, and they had a close relationship. The Lord would speak with Adam, teaching Adam, and he would walk and they would be in the garden together. He learned from God, perhaps on that first Sabbath day. Unfortunately, though, this familiar relationship between man and God did not stay the norm. We know what happens, but you can turn over a chapter to chapter 3, two chapters over in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. We see Adam and Eve making a decision, a decision which changed it all. Genesis 3 and verse 7. Then the eyes, so this is after taking of the tree, the forbidden tree. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. We talked a lot about coverings the other day. Now, this is a different Hebrew word. This literally means a physical covering. They made clothes out of fig leaves. I don't know how that felt. I like wool. I like wool blends. I like merino wool. I like alpaca. I don't know what fig leaves feels like. But they made themselves clothes. And in verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they made that decision, they suddenly noticed that they were naked. And they suddenly realized that they needed to hide themselves from God. 
They were ashamed. They removed themselves, physically separating themselves from God. In a real sense, in that moment, Adam and Eve became aliens from God. They became alienated from God. Look at verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and he clothed them. So now God, knowing that fig leaves were not going to hold up, he takes care of perhaps the first sin offering. Makes them tunics of skin, perhaps of an animal death. But it's tunics of skin. Verse 22, and then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put on his hand and take also of the tree of life, eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so in a fulfilled sense, Adam and Eve became foreigners to God. They became separated from God's presence. They became separated from walking with God, from learning from God in that same way. And in one sense of the word, they became aliens. Became aliens from God's nation and from the truth of his light. And since Adam and Eve sinned in that garden... Thousands of years of human interaction has been alienated from God. Thousands of years of human interaction have been alienated from God. On this day of atonement, we can look forward to the reconciliation of God with men. That's a beautiful picture that we see within the day of atonement. A reconciliation, bringing men back into a non-alienated state from God. Let's jump into this a little bit. And let's talk about the problem of alienation, because when we think about all of human history, the majority, mankind has been alienated from God. Turn with me over, if you will, to Isaiah 59. Now we're going to go over one chapter from what we heard earlier today. My sermon won't cover much to do with fasting today. There are so many connections, different principles and and facets you can pull out. But we're going to go one chapter over from what we heard in the sermonette into Isaiah 59. It's often a familiar section of scripture, but we're going to talk about the main problem here in this first point. The problem of alienation from God. You see, sin alienates man from God. Since Adam and Eve and the sin that they made, they created what would you would call perhaps the pattern of life that many have followed suit. In fact, we know all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We'll talk about that later. But one day, while, wa while they were walking and talking with God, learning from God, the next day they were cut off. One day connected, another day alienated. And it wasn't that God was kind of done with them. No, indeed, God is not done with man. But because of their choice, they chose to remove themselves from God. Look at Isaiah 59 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear you. This connects very well with what we read in Isaiah 59, just in the sermonette. It was the sins that separated them from God. That it was the reason God did not hear them in their fasts. I don't mean to rehash the sermonette, but it connects very well with what was just discussed. The idea that they were going through the motions and their sins, they weren't treating the neighbor properly, all the things that were listed in Isaiah 58. But in Isaiah 59, it says, sin has separated you, iniquities have separated you. You see, the problem of alienation comes from the fact that mankind continues to sin, continues to reject God and his righteous standard, which is defined by law. And it is our choices, our iniquities, our sins is what separates us. That's the reason God does not hear us. 
You can think of that as from mankind's perspective. I'm not, we'll touch on the church in a moment. But even those in the church, too often do we look for others to blame. Well, I have this problem or that problem. I can't do this or that. It's like, well, how are you on even the physical laws of God? Not to mention the spiritual laws, the spiritual intent of some of the laws. We're so quick to, to point the finger at, well, if the system would just be better, or if this or that, that's exactly what society does. Well, the system's a problem. No, it's us. We're the problem. We sin. We choose to reject God and his righteous standard. And it's because of that, mankind gets alienated from God. They get separated. There is this gap between them and God. And it's sin. The problem that plagues society is caused by sin. Isaiah continues in chapter 59, by inspiration of God, showing the society that is alienated from God. Look at verse 3. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity, violence, and deception. That's the common mode of, an, of a society alienated from God. This is the main story of man's history. Hands filled with bloodshed. Wars after wars. Lusting for things they cannot have. That's where these desires come from. Or that's where wars come from. From the desires of lust within our members. We know that from James. They lust, but they cannot have, so they take by force. Look at verse 4. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. No justice, no truth. There's no justice and there's no truth. A society separated by God does not call for true justice. But some desire it, and we're going to read about that in a moment. They desire justice, but they're so misaligned. They don't know where true justice is because they don't have the truth. In fact, Romans 1 talks about the truth that they obscure, the truth that they withhold because they are unrighteous. Romans 1 talks about that. That they hide the truth because they are unrighteous. They don't have the truth of God, so they don't really know the way to justice. Empty words. They give empty words and speak lies. Boy, does that sum up the political movements of our world. Anybody that believes the politician, I got a bridge to sell you somewhere. Is that the term? That's what politicians do. In America, it just seems like more and more we're sliding into where even our politicians are so corrupt and crooked. It's like a week goes by and another indictment comes from any other member of Congress. Ex-president, members of Congress, all sorts. Corruption is rampant. Empty words. They don't know the ways of justice. This is a society alienated from God. Look at verse 5. They hatch viper's eggs and weave the spider's web. And we're going to get into some imagery here. He who eats of their eggs dies. And from, with, from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. Talking a lot about unproductive ways. No growth in the long run. These metaphors are given to introduce and illustrate two basic needs. Foods, food and clothing. They look for food and they weave for their clothing. Their work first seems very productive. They're doing these things, they're hatching the eggs, they're spinning the webs. But in the end, it's not productive. The eating the eggs, that kills. Spinning the webs, it leads to no clothing. A viper breaks out. Wickedness seems productive at first. You can spin a lie, you can, you can claim this is the way to go, this is how we fix our problems. And it seems productive at first, but it leads to destruction. Often even those that are of wicked seem to be winning the race. King Solomon pointed that out thousands of years ago. The race goes to not always the swiftest. In the end is destruction though for wickedness. Look at human history that's summed up here in verse 7 and 8. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known. 
and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Boy, has mankind been good at shedding innocent blood. So much death. Wars after wars, so much innocent blood, even in war. And, and we have to mention, in the Western world, the thousands and thousands, millions of unborn children slaughtered in the name of women liberty, freedom. We know that's not true liberty. We know true liberty comes in part by what this day pictures. The day of Jubilee on the Day of Atonement, that releasing of the captives. Isaiah 58 actually talks about that. We read that earlier. So much shedding of innocent blood. The path of society that is separated of God or from God is a crooked path. Though the path looks straight, though it looks right, and it looks so easy, it's the wrong path. We know that the right path is narrow, hard to find. Many don't find it. They can't know it without God showing it. We're going to talk about that. But look how Isaiah 59 continues. There are those who don't shed innocent blood, but they're still separated from God. There are those that desire justice, but they can't find it. Look at Isaiah 59 and verse 9. Therefore, justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there's darkness for brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the walls like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as it is twilight. We are dead man in desolate, desolate places. You see, alienation from God is likened to darkness. And the image here is seen throughout Scripture. God is of light. Those who are not with God, those who are not called out, are in darkness. Whether they are, you know, committing abominable acts, or ignorantly going about their way. They are in darkness. Darkness is for those that are not near to God. Darkness is for those that are separated, those that are alienated. But sometimes people desire the light, but they can't find it. That's what Isaiah is talking about here. They're like the blind, just shimmying along the wall. Okay, how do I find the opening to this room? They can't find it. We're going to talk about in a little bit what pulls us from that darkness. They stumble around, but they do not know. They grasp for justice, but they cannot see. They are blind, spiritually speaking. At different times in human history, we haven't always been alienated from God. There have been pieces. There've, the nation of Israel even did good at times. Turn with me over to Isaiah 3. You can read through Isaiah 59 at another time. Did I say Isaiah 3? I meant Amos 3. They're not the same. <laughs> right there before Obadiah, right after Joel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Amos chapter 3, we see at different times, even in, in Israel's history, they weren't totally cut off from God. Amos chapter 3, and of course, God kept his covenant promises long after Israel kept being disobedient. God is indeed incredibly merciful. Amos chapter 3 and verse 1, Hear the word of the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. You see, within the Lord's prophecy through Amos to Israel, we see that God really cared about Israel, and indeed still does. We know from Romans and Paul's writings under inspiration that God has not cast off physical Israel. God indeed still has a plan for them, just like we heard in the song. God has a plan for Israel, and part of it is fulfilled in this day in meaning. A day of cleansings for the nation of Israel, for the world to be at one with God. We see that through Abraham and one family, God would bring through his plan of salvation, which, of course, was the seed, Christ, through whom all nations can be blessed. Romans 1 talks about the power of God. 
which is in Christ, the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God unto salvation is what it says. That's Romans 1. It's through one family that that happens, through Abraham, through Israel. We then become partakers of that same blessing through Christ, even if we're not physical Israel. He continues, can two walk together unless they are agreed? A brilliant understanding. You have to agree. You have to be in line with God. If you're going to walk with God, you have to align yourself to, you have to be justified. You have to be in line with God. Let's look at verse 7. Surely the Lord God has done nothing unless he revealed his secret to his servants, the prophet. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, but who can, uh, who can but prophesy? You see, we know that God is not just some merciless God. He warns. He provides the path of justice. He calls and he, and he liberates those who seek him. And he reveals his plan to the prophets. But as Israel sinned, at times they came out of alignment with God and they were alienated from God. That's like the life of the prophets. Some of the prophets were not doing what was right either. But the prophets are constantly warning the people, you're, you're alienated from God. Your sins are separating you from God. Turn back to God. The nation became aliens to God time and time again, separated from their God. But we know that God was still working for them, for a greater purpose. And of course, he was always working with spiritual Israel. He was always building up and working with those who were faithful. As Romans says, living from faith to faith. A handful of individuals. You know, if it's a fun study if you ever look into it. There's only a handful of individuals that have the phrase, they walked with God. So that phrasing, walked with God, it's a fun side study if you ever look into it. That's part of those who were faithful. Those who did trust in God and come under that same plan of salvation under a different time. This simple truth revealed in God's plan is that sin separates man from God. Because we choose to reject God's laws, because we choose wickedness over goodness, we are alienated from God. The problem is clear. The problem is clear. Sin separates us from God. What is the solution? The solution is found within the meaning of today. Reconciliation. Being made right with God, which God reveals to his prophets. The solution that we find is within the Day of Atonement. Let's go back to Leviticus 16. I say let's go back to it. We were just there this last Sabbath. But for those that, that weren't with us, we're going to cover a couple concepts that we covered this last Sabbath. But it'll be a good reminder for us on, from last Sabbath. Leviticus 16, we see a lot of meaning within the symbolism here in Leviticus 16 of uh, many cleansings. Many atonements. Um, for all those that are not familiar, the, the term atonement means covering or to cover one sin. Um, at least the, the term that's translated atonement from the Hebrew. The English atonement means uh, atonement, really, is what it means. But in Leviticus 16, we see within the meaning here much symbolism of a reconciliation process. How God reconciles people to himself. Now in Leviticus 16, we see these are physical types of a spiritual reality. Leviticus 16 and verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when, the, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time in the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. We know that God's place is holy. And he's to be regarded as holy. Aaron's sons, they didn't do that. They probably mixed a little bit of alcohol with their duties. And they offered profane fire. And thus, they were, just, they were uh, killed. Their life ended quickly for that rash decision. They did not regard God's presence or God's place as holy and God made an example of them at a time when Israel was starting or restarting if you will 
In Leviticus 16, we see, and we talked about this last Sabbath, many atonements, many cleansings, many physical representations of what needs to take place for Israel to be realigned with God, and then for also all mankind to be realigned with God. Because that's going to happen in the future. Israel will be reset. Uh, well, we're going to talk about that in a moment. But in Leviticus 16, we have these cleansings. Look at verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself. Then he shall take a censer full of the burning coals. So he does all these things. Let's go to verse 14. We read about this on the Sabbath. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. And throughout this process, the high priest would do this sprinkling and it would cleanse different aspects of what it represented, the high priest. We talked about the seven categories this last Sabbath. Seven categories of cleansings here in Leviticus 16. And what they future, what they uh, are fully realized when this day of atonement is fulfilled in future. Each year, Israel would sin, and they would defile their relationship with God. Let's go to Leviticus 17 and verse 11, one page over in my Bible. It's funny, I just reached for some water. I'm getting parched. <laughs> <clears throat> Leviticus 17 and verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. It's interesting, within this one verse is so much truth. You know, science has only just recently in mankind's history even realized the aspect they caught up a little bit to god concerning this haven't they the life is in the blood we used to we used to do bloodletting in the human history we thought well there's something wrong with the blood let's let it out let's clean the body and people were dying yeah you remove too much blood and you die um, now i think they still do that somewhat under more controlled ways with like leeches and stuff all you all you medical professionals out there <laughs> They, that's another topic for another day. But they do it in more controlled amounts. We understand blood more now. <laughs> but they still don't get it all. But the life is in the blood. And he says, I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. So more than just the physical aspect of, well, you run out of blood, you die. The spiritual aspect is the blood is given for atonement, for cleansing, and for resetting. For picturing what Christ ultimately did with his blood. We'll talk about that moment. But as they went through these atoning ceremonies, the priests could then come into the tabernacle, into the temple, and continue their work yearly. But we know that these things were only a fleshly type. They were a symbol. They only did a physical cleansing. The reality is within Christ. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9 and verse 6, we're going to read Hebrews 9, 6 through 10. The context here of verse 6, the writer is talking a lot about the physical tabernacle, the physical temple, the earthly things. In fact, in the end of verse 5, he says, of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So there was some changing throughout the years when they wrote this near 70 AD, somewhere around there. There were some changes and things that were happening. In verse 6, Now when these things has thus been prepared, so when they built the physical things, when they overlaid it with gold, when they built everything special, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing services. But into the second part of the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood which he offered for himself for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Remember, we talked about that a lot on the Sabbath, the idea of these cleansing ceremonies helping for the sins that were done in ignorance. 
the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the Holy of Holies was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. What was it? Verse 9, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. It was concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. You see, these were just representations of what would happen through Christ. That Christ would cleanse. That Christ would atone. You see, the Day of Atonement pictures a reconciliation process. It's so beautiful. This day pictures a time when mankind is no longer separated from God. <clears throat> that mankind can be brought back into a right alignment with God. And this fulfillment from the Holy Day shadow includes an atoning for the land. We talked about this on last Sabbath, but if you didn't hear my sermon on that, go read Leviticus 16 and remind yourself. There was two goats. Removing that goat with the sin laid upon his hand, cleansing and resetting of the land to allow for a rekindling or reconciliation back to God. Of course, this partners with Revelation 20 and the binding of Satan. We often focus a lot about that on the Day of Atonement. I'm not covering too much today. But the binding of Satan and really resetting and having the opportunity for mankind to then be in rec reconciliation back to God. But it starts, and God will restart it, with physical Israel. Look back at Zechariah chapter 8. Look back at Zechariah chapter 8. You see, God's faith is performed in that he keeps his promises. And he will fulfill these prophecies. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 8, in verse 20, 20 through 23. Con considering a time in the future, a time that we look forward to in fulfillment. Thus says the Lord of hosts, people shall come inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us continue to go up and to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will also go. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. You see, it's going to be established once again. <clears throat> Israel will be brought back. The nations of Israel, the remnant that are left uh, after the tribulation, will be brought back to their land. They'll go to Jerusalem and they'll pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. There's a reconciliation, a rest restoration process that God will ultimately begin with Israel in the millennium, and that'll extend to the whole world. Ultimately starting in the 1,000 year reign of Christ and the saints. This is a time of reconciliation that will be fully realized. Alienation of mankind caused by sin can only be overcome by God in Christ. That's the reality. You see, God and Christ have designed this wonderful plan, and they are offering their image or the family identity to all those who will heed the call. That plan is to bring many sons and daughters into a glorified state. We know that God gave his son as an atoning sacrifice. First John mentions that. That he gave his son for an atoning sacrifice. Let's go to Romans chapter 3 in verse 23 through 26. Romans 3 in verse 23. Christ indeed is that atoning sacrifice. For those taking notes, I can give you the reference. 1 John 4.10, it was the explicit reference that I made of God giving his son as an atoning sacrifice. That was 1 John 4.10. But in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, we can see this same reconcilia reconciliation type process being written about. Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
You see, sin separates you. Sin brings us short of the glory of God. You can't be glorified and be full of sin. That has to be fleshed out. Being, verse 24, being justly uh, justified freely by his grace, so being made, made in line again with God, justified by the grace through the redemption that is in of Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. We don't use that word very often anymore, do we? But his sacrifice was a gift of redemption. And it's by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith of Jesus. You see, Christ is that propitiation of faith. And it demonstrates his righteousness, his faithfulness. You go do a study, if you haven't lately, of Israel, physical Israel, and how they went into captivity, northern tribes, southern tribes. God brings back Judah. He reestablishes them to a small amount. He builds them back up. And why does he do this over and over? Why is he kind of keeping track of Judah and kind of keeping them where they go? Well, mainly it's to demonstrate his righteousness, to fulfill his promises, and to bring the seed that all nations will be blessed. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. That came, and that was part of the process. <clears throat> Through it all, God demonstrates his righteousness. And the Day of Atonement is a time when true reconciliation will be had by all mankind. At least starting with those in the millennium who have lived through the tribulation, but spreading beyond until what the last great day pictures, that day of the small and great standing before God and giving their opportunity to live a life of judgment. When we think about the Day of Atonement, though, the lessons don't just stop with Israel. We can remember that as God's first fruits, we have this reconciliation now. You and I, as being called as the first fruits, who have committed our lives to God, we're called, we're chosen. If we make that commitment, we answer that call faithfully. We have this reconciliation now. Because, indeed, we were once aliens before, weren't we? Let's go to he Ephesians chapter 2. <coughs> Excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2. We were once aliens, but we are now reconciled. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. The context is about Gentiles, but we can get the point. Some of us are, like, are indeed Gentiles. I don't know my physical lineage. I'm not sure if you know yours. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. Let's start there. Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. So Paul's making it clear this is to the Gentile congregation. He's making this point that the Gentiles, those who are uncircumcised, not circumcised, or not uncircumcised, but we would say in the spirit, but in the flesh, they weren't physically circumcised. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. You see, being an alien is without hope. It says they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. The Gentiles, by far, the nations outside of Israel, had no hope, if you will. The only hope that they had was through the seed, which is made clear in Galatians chapter 3. You who are in Christ are the seed, or uh, you are Christ then, heir according to the promises, as it says. But verse 13, look. But now, in Christ Jesus... You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Even though we were once aliens because our sin separates us from God, when God calls us and he gives us that opportunity, if we come under the sacrifice of Christ, we are then brought near to God. We have this reconciliation now. Now. 
We are then Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. Because of Christ's sacrifice, we are in that atonement process now. Of course, as first fruits, we often think about this with Passover. Passover primarily being a festival for the first fruits, the spiritual recognition of it. We enter the covenant at baptism, and we often think of Passover as a renewal of that covenant every year. The Day of Atonement often pictures this rest, <coughs> or excuse me, the rest of those that will no longer be aliens in the future, fully being reconciled. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Remember, being aliens, alienated from God is described as a darkness. There is a darkness to being separated by God. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Paul is talking about this reconciliation process. <coughs> well, excuse me. <coughs> This reconciliation process, Colossians 1, in verse 12. Right in the middle of his, his, his thoughts here. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. See, that's the contrast. In the light. The saints, the people of God, are of the light, not of darkness. Darkness is symbolic of separation from God. You remember Isaiah 59, like the blind. They can't see. Light is of God. It's with God. Verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. What brings us out of the darkness? God. Grabbing us, sending the invitation, calling us from the darkness. They deliver us from the darkness and they transfer us. That's what conveyed is. They transfer us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. A beautiful reference scripture, 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2, I think in verse 9. Oh yeah, I have it in my notes. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. The idea of you were not a people once, but God has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous, glorious light. We are delivered from darkness. We are not to go back to that. You see, those who are of the darkness, even if they seek the light, if they don't have God's calling, if they don't have that understanding yet, they will not be able to find it. That's what Isaiah 59 is talking about. They're like the blind who look along the walls. They feel along the walls for just trying to find it. God ultimately calls and he brings whom he calls to Christ, to the body of Christ. Look at verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. You see, God is reconciling all to himself. Starting with the first fruits, he starts with Christ, the first or the best of the first fruits, who it says became sin for us. Right? He did not sin, but it, he became sin for us. Then the first fruits. Then the world. God is reconciling. Look at verse 21. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now, has been, has, uh, now he has reconciled. You see, we were once aliens. And we can alienate ourselves again. You can walk according to the ways of darkness. It's not a path that I'd recommend. Nor would God. You cannot taste of the heavenly things. You cannot have your eyes illuminated. You cannot be given the truth of God and turn away. There remains no more sacrifice for you. That's part of the warning in Hebrews. But once we were alienated by wicked works, 
he has now reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless above reproach in his sight. If, look at verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which am preached in every creature under heaven, <coughs> of which I, Paul, became a minister. See, only if we can... <coughs> Man, I got this tickle. <coughs> Excuse me. Only if we remain steadfast. And what do we do then with this deliverance? Remember, because we can think about the Day of Atonement, what it pictures in the future, the restoration of Israel, the reconciliation starting with Israel, moving to the whole world, the binding of Satan, all of it. We can think about the reconciliation process of ourselves today. But if we don't do anything with that, if we, if we fall away, then there's a trouble there. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. <clears throat> what do we do with this deliverance? Hebrews 10. <clears throat> Hebrews 10 and verse 19. <clears throat> what are we able to do with this deliverance, with this reconciliation? Look at the tie into the Day of Atonement in symbolism. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the Holy of Holies, or the holiest, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And we know that when Christ died, what physically happened in the temple? When he died, there's a lot of physical things that happened. And all sorts of things, all signs that he was the son of God. But you remember in relation to coming boldly in the Holy of Holies, that veil, that veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the tabernacle, that was torn in two. You ever looked into the size of that veil? That veil was, I think estimates are a hand's breadth uh, deep. So you're talking about five, six, eight inches thick. You're not having any man rip that veil. And you're talking, what is it? Um, I want to say 50 feet, but that may be too high. Tens of twenties of feet high. And it ripped from top to bottom, showing that the way into the Holy of Holies was now made manifest to those in whom God calls, brings to Christ, and come under that sacrifice. And by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So we come to God now through Christ. Verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart and the full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We come into that Holy of Holies any day we need to, daily, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And catch that reference? Sprinkled. We're sprinkled. We have our hearts, not just the flesh sprinkled, but we're sprinkled by the blood for evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. There's other references in Scripture that talks about the pure washing of the Word. The Word of God convicts us in partnership with the, the Spirit of God, convicts us of the sin, draws us to Christ, we then allow God, Christ's sacrifice to sprinkle our hearts and to work with our hearts in mind, having the law of God placed inwardly, understanding that we worship God in spirit and truth. And we hold fast then. Look at 24 or 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more the day, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. <clears throat> Do we see the day approaching? The signs are there. Now, whether or not he's approaching near or not, it's not us to know. It's only in the Father's authority, is what Christ said in Acts. But it sure seems like things are approaching. So we have to hold fast. We have to assemble. And when we assemble, we must stir up one another. Not with prodding and getting each other to do what is wrong, though there's some fun jests sometimes. <clears throat> 
but stirring up one another for good works and love. Staying fast through the confession of our hope without wavering. How are we able to do that? Because he who gives us the hope is faithful. You partnered that with Romans 1, from faith to faith. So we are to consider one another and stir up love and good works, assembling, joining together. You see, the Day of Atonement is such a beautiful day that pictures reconciliation. It's a wonderful step in God's plan to reconcile the mankind to himself. You see, because of sin, mankind is separated from God. And it's only then through Christ, God through Christ, can we be reconciled. As first fruits, we were once alienated. Before we were called, before we made that commitment, before we came under the sacrifice of Christ, we were once aliens too. But because of the atoning sacrifice of Christ, we can come boldly daily. And because of the sacrifice of Christ, God is also reconciling mankind to himself. First with Christ as the best of the first fruits, then the first fruits, and then all. Let us understand the greatness we have in Christ today. To boldly be able to come to the throne of God. Because we have that great high priest at our side, or at his side. Let us always look forward with joy for the day for this day in future fulfillment. When God will ultimately bind the ultimate source of sin and will make atonement for all. It will begin with Israel and spread to all mankind, starting with the remnant into the millennium. Let us look forward to that day in future when mankind is alienated no more.